Good morning, church. How is everybody doing today? It's good to be in the house of the Lord again. For those of you watching online, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such a blessing to have an online viewing audience, and we want to bless you today. And we want you, we want you to be released, not only to join us, but whatever God asks you to do in the privacy of your home or if you're driving down the road in your vehicle, engage. Amen? It is good to be in the house of the Lord and to learn. Everybody that is out there, come on in. Come on in and be seated. I want to talk to you just a little bit. Amen? This weekend on, uh, on Friday and Saturday, our leadership team had the opportunity to go away for a leadership retreat for two days and just to hear from the Lord for vision and direction. I tell you what, I, we, we are excited to, to say that in the month of January, when I get back from Florida, we have a new banner vision that we are going to unveil to you, uh, 2021, and we also made some changes to this banner that we're very excited about. Bruce, you would be you would be excited to know this, that I brought in a special speaker, and he wanted to stay, uh, but he had some commitments at home. Pat and Valerie Overholt, I brought them in from, from North Carolina, and they were here all day. Well, they got here Friday evening, had dinner with us, and then he spoke to our team yesterday and just imparted, and oh man, you talk about just some kingdom flowing in our midst. It was really good, really good. He taught us so many things. And uh, we just had a wonderful time. So church this morning, I want us to take a little bit of time to position our hearts to receive. And I want to encourage us, and just like Pat encouraged us yesterday, listen to me, okay? Church, I want you to listen to me just a little bit. Pat really encouraged us yesterday. He said, worship has to do with understanding who you are. Not as much to do with the music, not as much to do with the style of music, not as much to do with anything like that, but it has everything to do with understanding who you are and whose you are. That's what he told us yesterday. He taught us that. It's who you are and whose you are. And so when you worship, it comes from that place, not from a place of, oh, I like this song or I don't like this song. It's engaging with your heart. Amen. So I invite you to stand and let's pray. You see, we have some, we have quite a few people out of town from the worship team, and, uh, but they're off having a good time, and so we bless them. I don't think anybody is camping, so that's good. Uh, man, we are going to have to get away from that culture. Raymond, we have to get away from that camping culture thing. It's detrimental. It takes people away for the weekend. It's not good. It's just not good. I just have a hard time coming into agreement with that. But anyway, let's pray and uh, let's position our hearts to receive. Just ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes if you would, please. God, this morning, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. God, that statement means so much more to me as I understand kingdom better. You are king of kings, and you've called us to be kings. You've called us to be priests. And God, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. You own everything. You're in control of everything. And yet you release it to your ambassadors, your sons and daughters, for them to steward the things of the kingdom. So God, this morning as we walked into this place, we came in with the Holy Spirit already inside of us. We walked into the doors with kingdom already inside of us. We walked into this place not needing something to appear, but we brought it with us because we are filled with the kingdom. So God, we're not asking you to to bring your Holy Spirit here. We're not asking you for anything to come because you're already here. You're already in this place. What we're asking you this morning, Lord, is to reveal things in our lives that would hinder the manifestation of the Spirit of God to come out of us. Not only in our worship, but in our interaction with each other. 
And God, may we be reminded, the same as Pat reminded us yesterday, that everything that we do, when we understand who we are as sons and daughters, everything we do is worship. All of our actions, when we go to work, when we go to the marketplace, when we come to church, when we're in our life groups, no matter what we do, if we're giving announcements, no matter what we do, we're worshiping. If we're giving of our tithe, if we're giving of our offerings, we're worshiping. When we talk to each other in the house of God, we're worshiping. God, if we could have that mentality, and if that would become a part of our character, and we would understand that that's who we are. God, I believe that our environment would begin to change and shift as we walk in dominion and authority. Father God, we invite you by the Holy Spirit that is inside of us to give us a deeper and a greater revelation of that dimension. God, we've been tested, we've been tried, and that's only to prepare us for what is ahead. It has purpose. Every test we go through, every trial we go through shapes us, teaches us how to rejoice in great tribulation, and your word increases our faith. God, may worship come out of this place today. In Jesus' name, I want you to greet a couple people. Just turn around, greet a couple people, and bless about three or four, and then we are going to worship with everything we got. Stop the Lord. 
It's a done deal. Amen. Do you believe that? It is a finished work. We do not have to fight to try to gain something. We have to fight from a place that it's already finished. The battle's been won. Do you understand that? On the cross when Jesus gave his life and he said, it is finished. Nothing new needs to happen. It's already finished. Amen.
about you, but that just lets something loose inside of me. Many of you have ever been through a pretty difficult battle that you didn't think you were going to see the other side. Come on. Somebody be with me here. How many of you are just recently in a battle? And maybe you're even facing it now. You're not sure if you see the other side. Uh-huh. How many of you believe that the God that fights for you is able? Come on, let me hear you testify. How many of you believe that the God that fights for you is able? He is able. He is not limited in his resources. Listen, he's not limited in his resources. He's not limited in his ability to get you through. And I don't care where you're at right now. I don't care what part of the journey you're in. I don't care what part of the test you're in. So far, up to this point, you've made it through 100% of every situation you've ever faced. And you're still standing. He's not taking you out. The enemy has not killed you. He has not destroyed you. You're here. You have made it through. And you will make it through. Because we have a God that is fighting for us, that created the universe. And before you were ever knit together in your mother's womb, he knew everything you would face And he said, I've got to put a plan together. And it's plan A, not plan B. It's plan A. It's the best plan. And he said, i got to put that plan together because I want to see you and you and you and you and you succeed. Isn't that awesome? Oh, it just blesses me. That's good truth. of you that raised your hands and said you're in the middle or you're at the beginning or you're towards the end of a battle right now and it's tough you see mountains on each side you see obstacles in front of you and the enemy is coming hard I want you to know that not only does God fight for you but he sends the hosts of heaven because he's the Lord of hosts and he's with us as we sing this song I want you to to look with your spiritual eyes and I want you to imagine what it must look like around this place with the hosts of heaven with the angels joining us in worship and singing what must that look like Lord, open our eyes to see that you are fighting for us and your angels are fighting for us.
to see that they're sons and daughters of the King. If they have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they are sons and daughters, and there's no way that they will fail. There is no way that they will fail unless they turn from their identity. God, teach us. Teach us to understand that we're sons and daughters. Teach us to understand what is in our inheritance. Every weapon that we need has been given to us, and it talks about it in the Word of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the attacks of the devil. Okay? Do you hear me? Put on the whole armor of God. I'm just going to speak a word. This is a word. I'm not going to single anyone out or the person out because I don't want to I don't want to single them out in front of everyone but this is a word from the Lord for someone in here this morning the longing the deep deep longing in your heart and the unanswered questions and the deep longing to be loved and to be held and to know that God loves you and that he approves of you I want you to know that all of those things that you cry out in your room by yourself all alone all alone, all alone. And as I say all alone, you feel the loneliness. You feel what that has felt like to a depth 
that you could not be able to explain with words. You have felt so alone. But I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that the God of heaven says, I will never leave you. I will not abandon you. So I want you to know you're not abandoned. I want you to know that you're not an orphan. I want you to know that he is a father. Father God, Daddy is a father. Abba Father is a father to those who need a father. He is a father to those who need a mother. To those who feel like there is something missing, something lacking in your life, he is that because he said, I am. So in your situation right now, and I could name it, but I don't want to, but in the things that you want, in the things that you are crying out to God for, I want you to hear the Father say, I am what you need. And I want it to bring a wholeness and a fulfillment into your spirit, soul, and body that it would quench the thirst and the longing and that you would not turn to anything else, that you would not turn to the right or the left. You would not turn to external things or worldly things or sensual things, but that you would continue to look to God, Father God, for your fulfillment. I speak blessing over you. You are valued. You are loved. And I believe you even know who you are and that I'm talking to you. I want you to know that I honor you today. I honor you today as a child of God, one who has been created in his image. And I call forth that image of the Heavenly Father out of you. I call that forth out of you in Jesus' name. And I pray his mercy would be lavished on you and his grace. You would experience it in a way that is abundant. Also want to speak. Also want to speak into the fear. There are some that are here today that <clears throat> there is a fear, a fear of not knowing what the future holds. The future is uncertain. You make decisions to the best of your ability. You make decisions according to what you believe that God is asking you to do. And yet there's a fear there. I want to set the table for that. In Jesus' name, you walk in obedience to whatever you're called to walk in. You walk in obedience to whatever you believe. You walk in obedience to what God is revealing to you. And that is welcome here. Obedience is welcome in this place. Faithfulness is welcome in this place. Integrity is welcome in this place. Fear is not. Anxiety is not. Depression is not free to be in this place. And so I declare with the words of my mouth that the things that line up with God and line up with his word and line up with truth, I loose them in Jesus' name over our congregation. The things that do not line up with God's will or his word or truth, I bind those in the name of Jesus and I declare them unlawful to operate in this place, to operate in anyone that attends here, or to operate in anyone who is watching or who will listen online later. And we release the kingdom, not holding it back, not moving it, not deciding how it works, but we give ourselves to the King of Kings. tithe is a part of our worship so if you feel led by the Lord to tithe I've seen some of you do it already we have two baskets up front and we have one in the back we also can give online it um, 
giving online is, is a good thing. I encourage it. But I also encourage you to tithe as an act of worship. And you can do it from your seat. So do it during worship. I love that. I just think that's important that we recognize. I think it's a way to remind ourselves that everything belongs to the Lord. Amen. Everything belongs to the Lord. Praise the Lord.
draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. See yourself. Can you see yourself moving towards the throne? I get the picture when I, when I hear that verse, draw near to God, he draws near to you. I, I, I get the picture of the prodigal son. And he's coming. And he's cresting the hill. And the father is out there watching. Oh, I think it's him. I think it's him. And then I think of Matthew. Matthew, at the end of the one chapter, it says, come to me. Oh, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And the sun crests the top of the hill, and the dad, I can just see him. I know this is kind of weird how I think sometimes. You'll just have to bear with me as I let you into my head a little bit. I see him hiking up his robe and just takes off trucking down the road as hard as he can. Son. And he draws near. Ugh. It's all about you, Jesus. 
share. Okay. Let's see what let's see what that microphone is on for. Good morning, Bethesda. Good morning. Um, so Leroy, you had shared this morning already about how fear should not be a part of this service. And I'd like to share a story about overcoming fear this morning. That's uh, very, very real to us. So last week you had shared from Hebrews 10. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It is a manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You shared the scripture and you commented there was the work of the enemy. The enemy trying to keep us staying at home from church. And that really convicted myself, and I think convicted you as well, Cheryl, that we needed to stand up front here this morning because we were watching at home from church. And we had also made the decision that we probably would have to for the foreseeable future. And why is that? Well, back in the middle of November, there was this order that came out from the state of Pennsylvania on universal masking. And I wanted to see, well, you know, are they going to talk about churches at all this time? And what do you know? They actually did. There was a question in there online. It says, do I have to wear a mask at a house of worship such as a church, synagogue, or mosque? And it said, yes, you do. And, and so I felt that I needed to obey. I felt the conviction that I needed to do that. And for me, personally, it was about the two kingdoms. And some of you, you know, have some background on this. You, you've heard about this in the past. I'm not going to go deeply in, but I really felt convicted. And I believe that I do need to live as a foreigner and as a pilgrim in this country, this physical country in which I live, that I'm called to obey the authorities, even if it's inconvenient. And it was inconvenient when I was trying to worship this morning with a mask on. I could not sing as much. Now, compared to, you know, people in perse really persecuted countries and the threats they're under, it's, it's fairly minimal, but still, it impeded my worship. And you can even ask, or I thought about, well, you know, what if all these conspiracy theories are true? What if it's true? What if, pe what if there are elements out there trying to take away all the rights of Americans? But it doesn't matter to me because I'm of a different kingdom. But the government didn't say that I have to stay at home and watch on live stream. But that's exactly what we did last week. So why didn't we come to church? Was it fear? Did we just want to be more comfortable in our jammies? Let's find out. I have to say, I wasn't in my jammies last week. I was dressed and I'd already left the house and come back. However, sincerely, it is due to fear that I stayed home. It is due to desire for comfort that I stayed home. It's due to fear of man. I have no fear of the government. As Randy said, we're of a different kingdom. I've absolutely knew no fear of a virus. Matthew 10, 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. COVID is unable to kill the soul. The government is unable to kill the soul but rather fear of him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Now, it doesn't refer to who I'm afraid of here. But I have to confess, I was afraid of man. And I don't want, y'all have been wonderful in supporting us. And so I don't want anyone to take this as, I don't like you. I'm mad at you. But I'm afraid of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm afraid of what each of you is going to think of me. That is a fear of man. That is wrong. The Bible says that is wrong. But I've heard and I've read on Facebook specific individual members 
calling out on social media and in conversations. A person who wears a mask is a sheeple. A person who wears a mask is ignorant. A person who wears a mask doesn't research the issue themselves. And I get this in the discomfort of worshiping in, in assembly. It's because, quite frankly, I don't want to be called a sheeple. I don't like being thought of as ignorant. And I don't like to be thought of as not willing to research the issue on my own, none of which are true. But it wouldn't matter if they were. So yes, I confess that I was not here. I was, I was convicted by Leroy's message. I was not here due to fear and due to discomfort. I was also not here out of fear of the local body of Christ, which is really a sad thing when I think about it. But it was true. It was true. I also was not in my jammies. I was dressed. I had my fuzzy slippers on, though. And I do want to bless the, uh, the sound team. I really want to bless the sound team. Because, yeah, I got to sleep in a bit that day, didn't I? And some of, some of you and some of the uh, worship team were up at 4.30 getting up. So bless you for that, giving me that opportunity. But it was true. It was fear of man. Social media, conversations in church, all that. It was fear. I felt that there would be a spirit of condemnation, and we just didn't want to deal with it. And that's sad. So today... I'm repenting of that choice. And I'm coming against it in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to be fearful to live out my spiritual convictions. What God has laid on my heart, I'm not going to accept condemnation. And if sheep it is, I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> and I am looking forward to worshiping with each one of you. God bless. So let me, let me just address what you guys said, okay? So Randy and Cheryl, look at me, okay? I want you guys to know that I value you as a part of the body of Christ at Bethesda. And I apologize from my heart for not effectively setting the table at this place at this house of worship that someone would even remotely have a fear of coming in here and exercising what you believe that God is asking you to do. I think a lot of it has to do, and today we're going to learn a very valuable kingdom principle. When people don't do things the same as we do, we are very quick to condemn and to judge. I've seen this over the last year with COVID is that it has really brought a condemnation out of the church that really grieves my heart. I do not engage in it on social media, nor will I. But maybe this will cause us to address some issues in our own hearts, in my own heart. Is that am I okay to continue to worship with people that believe differently than me? That is the question. Do I still see people as brother and sister when they choose to exercise things differently than I do. Listen, this is so far beyond mask. It is so far beyond COVID. It is conditions in our heart that are very prejudiced. And so I want to thank you guys for sharing. And church, I want to take ownership for my part, regardless of where you're at, regardless of where I'm at on any issue or any mandate or anything that the government has brought out. Do we still see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ? And do we still love each other unconditionally? So church, I'm going to ask for a response from you. Not only am I asking for your forgiveness, for not being as effective as I should have been as a leader to set the table, for people from every tribe, tongue, nation, from every, no matter where they come out on, on their practice or belief, that I have not been effective in setting the table. So I'm asking for your forgiveness as well. But they also ask for forgiveness. So would you be willing to show that, if you can, from your heart, 
just by standing here to your feet to let them know that you know what I stand with you as a brother and a sister in Christ I love you no matter what you choose to practice no matter what you choose to believe I stand with you and I love you and would you also forgive me church for not being the shepherd And, uh, and setting the table as effectively as I should have. Because I do. <laughs> uh, I do love you guys. I really do. Please. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Randy and Cheryl. Thank you so much for sharing. Church, let's let this go to our hearts. Let's let this be a very good lesson for us of how quickly somebody can feel uncomfortable in our midst because of our, our attitudes. And if we truly believe something, we don't have to shout it from the rooftops and convince everybody else that what I believe is the best way and, and what I have is, is the most truth. Come on, church. Wow. doesn't matter where you come out on things. We still should love each other. Amen. I think it would be appropriate to sing the first verse, the pre-chorus, and the chorus of this song again, because I think that's where we've lost the focus. When the music fades, and all is stripped away, and I sing. Just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, or a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper. started church again we started church from a place saying you are responsible you know I I will make this statement not everybody will agree with me on this but this is just where I'm at and it's where the premise or the foundation was that we as a ministry team made the decision to meet again the government is not responsible for my health I'm responsible you're responsible. If you do not feel comfortable gathering, there is absolutely no condemnation for you if you choose to practice in a different way. Even if you do choose to stay at home, there's still no condemnation from me. If you choose to attend and wear a mask, that is your responsibility and that's your freedom. We are not going to mandate anything as a church. That's the decision that we made as a as a ministry team, you are responsible, and we're responsible for our health. And so be very careful. If there are concerns, let us know. And church, again, maybe this we talked about this in, in May. Maybe it's time for us to talk about it again. Let's respect each other. Let's respect each other's space. If there's somebody that's not comfortable with shaking hands or hugging or whatever, respect that. Ask. Maybe extend your hand first. I know we're kind of a huggy church, but maybe extend your hand first. And if that's okay, if somebody says, uh, I'd rather not, then let's respect each other. Amen? 
Can we do that? And we can still love each other, even if we completely see things differently. Even if we disagree, we can still worship together as a body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Bruce. in between announcements and all that kind of stuff. Most of our children, I heard them go booking out of here. Right away, for those of you that are visitors, we have children's ministry for ages 3 to 10, and they are welcome to attend. If you head towards that back exit door, uh, we will have people back there that will point you in the right direction. Ages 3 to 10, you're welcome to be a part of uh, children's ministry. Renewing the mind at Jenga. <laughs> I don't know about you, Bruce. You pull out all kinds of things. <clears throat> Brother, we welcome you. Well, thank you. Brother, you are a part of the family of Bethesda. You've been here, it's normally after one time, then you're considered family. Oh, okay, Yeah, cool. so now you've been here multiple times. You did a bro live broadcast with that's us right. as well. So you're basically a part of our church. Well, that, that's cool. And, yeah. And your group would co had come to the vertical and the leadership yeah. thing. And so, yeah, amen. So... Good to know so many people. You're like there. a father to us. Isn't that something? Oh, yeah. Man. I'm humble. It's the gray hair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amen, it's brother. More it's more than so gray. Good. It's white. It's white. You have white hair like my father-in-law does. Isn't my wife something? loves yeah. that. I, I don't think I'm going to get there, honey. I'm not going to look like Bruce. It's just going to be. It's going to be off. But that's okay, brother. It's so good to have you here. I want to release you, and uh, we need the word of God. All right. Amen. Hey, Let me cool. pray with you. All right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you so much for, for Bruce and Ruthie and for bringing them into our midst. And God, we release them this morning to share with us whatever you have laid on their hearts. How do we need the word? It's obvious in this season. We need the word and we need it written and engraved on our hearts. Uh, God, today it is a joy to release Bruce to preach the good news of the gospel the good news that Jesus Christ came, and the kingdom. God, let it be manifest in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. If I can get a couple preliminaries out of the way really quick. Uh, if if uh, there's anybody here called an usher. Oh, well. I thought I had some... Uh, um, I have a, a newsletter. I don't send many teachings out, but... There's more teachings coming because I feel like there's a lot of leadership uh, skills that need to be uh, addressed. If, and if you would like to just put your name and your email address, clear email address. One thing you can't read, you put it wrong, it doesn't work. Okay, really clear, big. And uh, if you would mind doing that, I don't send a lot out, but I feel like there's some, some really important things that Ruthie and I are going to be sharing in the near future and if you'd like to be on that just do that and then uh pass them in if you don't have a pen uh i thought i had some pens over ruthie maybe i'll look there let me just see here oh yeah here's some pencils if you don't have any i just have one in back or i charge you 49.95 for each pencil okay does someone else want to give out any pencils if anybody Needs a pencil three. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was dangerous there, wasn't it? Okay, I want to do that. I'd love for you to be on my mailing list and friend me, send me a friend request. Okay, uh, I have some books here. I asked Leroy if I could just share them. I'm not going to have a book table out today. Some of you have been to the conferences. You've got them. You've been tweaked. That's probably, I don't, it's, it hasn't sold as much as maybe some of my other books. It's just a fable. 
but I've probably gotten a, a lot of responses on your identity and the battle for your, uh, your God identity. The, uh, from, and it's, a, it's just a, a fun story, good for teenagers, whatever. Kingdom Culture is le a leadership book. It's, uh, <laughs> well, actually, it's every, I say, from marriage to business and everything in between. It's how to create a culture that births great teams and uh, just, you know, the, from a kingdom culture at church, we always say, whenever we have a problem at the church where I go, we always say, how can we handle this in, according to a kingdom culture? What are the principles? To kill a lion, many of you have seen that. To kill a lion transforming your life through sexual freedom. It goes to the root of sexual addiction. This one here is just came out recently, and uh, it's called Come Alive to Her Heart. A challenge for married men on emotional connecting. I don't know why I brought it here. I was thinking, why did I bring it here? Because no men here have any problem emotionally connecting with their wives. But I thought maybe they would know someone that had. Yes, the, yes, that's right. Come alive to her heart. You can get these all on Amazon. Christmas is coming up. God, do you play? It's a storybook for children. It's a poem on how God is with you at all time. Eros and Agape is probably our most foundational message, the difference between the spiritual nature of eros, or I mean of agape, and the counterfeit that's even alive in the church today. It's a self-centered love, which is not agape. And this is our miracle journal, a collection of the amazing things God has done for Ruthie and I and our family throughout the years. Ruthie, is, we have many, many miracle journals. We decided to put them in a book for our kids to pass along. And then we thought it would inspire other families to have, uh, to just believe God. Believe God, okay? So that's out of the way. Now, I'm going to get into this because I want to share with you an introduction to what I believe is a lot. Okay, it's an introduction. And the reason I say that is because I am teaching this so you can build on it. Okay, I'm not giving you today, I'm not giving you a fish. I'm probably just giving you some skills for fishing. Okay, and when I, when I say it's renewing the mind and Jenga, I'm going to start out with Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be, now listen to this, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there's some things here. How do we become conformed to the world? We become conformed to the world when we are agreeing with the belief system of the world. But what God wants, and I believe that our initial discipleship has everything to do with the renewing of your mind, the transformation that you're going to experience in your life and your walk with God is going to come through the renewing of your mind. Now, that word, renewing, in the Greek language, is in the present tense, means it's a continual process. Now, for some of you, if you've been to some of, uh, if you've been to Take Back Your Life or you've been to any of my um, seminars, or some of, some of the day you may have heard before. And as soon as Leroy asked me if I would speak here today, I felt immediately that this was what I was supposed to teach. And I thought, yeah, but, but, but they've heard it. Before some of them have been, they it might be review, and I felt like God gave me a, a different dimension. And so what I'm saying is, I feel like what I'm sharing today is for you. Um, the renewing of the mind is very important. It starts with a decision. Ephesians 4:22. <clears throat> it says that you put off the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And then two verses later, it says you put on the new man or the new self, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
those words in the original language in the Greek or in the aorist tense. That means it's a once for all act. It's a once for all decision that you put off in your mind, you say, I am choosing to put off the world, the flesh, the devil, the old man, everything that's associated with that. Not a continual. Not a continual. And putting on the new man is a once and done decision. Putting on the new man. But in between, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That is not in the aorist tense. That is in the present tense. And so I can translate it this way. By a once-for-all act, put off the old man and be continually, all the time, being renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man. Now, why is that in between? Because the journey from the old self to the new self starts with a decision, but it is our mind being renewed in the process. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, he says, I am in labor until Christ is formed in you. Till Christ is formed in us. And how is Christ formed in us? When we are able, when we have found a pathway to uncover the accusation of the enemies and the lies of the enemy and align ourselves to the covenant of God, the promises of God, and our inheritance, that is Christ being formed in us. And that's what it's all about. Now you say, well, why do I, why do I have Jenga out here? You know, I, uh, I normally have a little table here, but if you can scope in on this thing here. Jenga, how many know, have heard of Jenga? Okay. How many don't know what Jenga is? Okay, there's a few of you who don't know. Jenga is, a, you, you have a tower, and they even have these big Jengas, you know. I, that's what I should have, the, you know, the adult size Jenga. And, uh, and what happens, what you do is you start in the second layer, and you start pushing out. Now, you're only allowed to use one hand, but for preaching purposes, I'm going to use two. And you pull one out. And, and so what happens is, and then one person goes back and forth, and you take this out, and the person that pulls out the block that makes the tower fall, they lose. And, and so one day I'm, I'm watching Jenga, and all of a sudden I get, I said, this is, this is our, our discipleship. This is Christ being formed in us. So you have, to pay Gen you have to play Jenga if you get saved. <laughs> but not physical Gen Gen Jenga. You have, to, you have to understand that in, Rome, in Revelation chapter 12 says that the devil is what? He is the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses the brethren all day long, every day. He's out to accuse you. And what is he saying when he accuses you? He is, the accuser of the brethren is also called, in John chapter 8, he's the father of lies. The father of lies. The devil doesn't... Don't you like what I'm teaching, Sandra? Sa Sandra's leaving, huh? She just got up and, and, and walked. And she, she has to leave. But I like to pick on her. I'm the accuser of the, of the brother. That was a good example. <laughs> she picks on me too, yeah. Okay, so anyways, he is the accuser of the brethren. Now, I, I want to tell you, if the enemy can tell you lies that you believe that you never discover who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you, he will render you ineffective in the kingdom of God. And I love to hear what was said about fear and the testimonial. You decided we're not going to live by fear. So what does it mean? It means that our discipleship process is a process of uncovering and discovering those things that are out of alignment with who God says we are 
and who Christ is in me. Do you know the neat thing about this whole thing, Christ in us, the hope of glory? It's God. Now listen to this because this is important. God lives in us as us. Did you hear me? God lives in us as us. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. But I have found my discipleship process has been a process of going through so many different levels of pulling out lies. It's like, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with God. That's of the wor world. That's of the flesh. That's accusation. And as we align ourselves with God, he uncovers these lies. Now, sometimes these lies can just hit us at certain times. They're not with us all the time. Like, for example, what happened to the couple who gave their testimony this morning, they had a fear to come to church wearing a mask because they feared being judged. People, please. But they broke that fear. They broke their agreement with it. I break, I broke my agreement with this kind of mic. Do you, okay. Oh boy, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> now I forget where I was. Where was I? Huh? Oh yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So so I get a bill for I get a bill for a transmission that went out of my car and it's like twice what I th oh thank you it's like twice what I thought it would be and I'm laying on the on the on the living room floor in the fetal position said ah thank you oh yeah hey. <laughs> I was just getting used to that bro and I and I'm laying on the floor and and Ruthie comes up to me and she says oh she says, God is not big enough to take care of that bill. Thank you, wife. <laughs> Submit. <laughs> and it's like, I, she does this to me all the time. Not, and not as mean, but, but it happened. It happened when we were coming home from a, a conference in Dover what, two days ago, three days ago? Yeah, Thursday. She it, it came home, and I, listen, I have a pride about not losing my way. I am a good navigator. Awesome navigator. All men are, All men are. no, I know some that aren't. And I, twice, or three times, okay, I said twice, she said three times, we'll take her three times, I couldn't figure out where I was. And one time, there were two highways going this way, and I just pulled right in the middle. And I, I pulled off and went the wrong way. And I am so frustrated. I am like losing my mind over this. And I'm ah, beating myself up. And she says, calm down. God may have a plan. God may have a plan. So we pulled up to the next place, and we're looking. The GPS is taking us all around. And I had to stop in the middle of another place. And Ruthie said, go that way. And I went this way. And I beat myself up again. And Ruthie didn't say, I told you so, out loud. <laughs> but you know, right there, I had to do something. Repent. Repentance isn't coming down the order and crying. Honestly, the word metanoia has nothing whatsoever to do with feelings and emotions. It's not bad when you feel sorrowful, godly sorrow. There's no problem with that. But that's not repentance. The repentance is when metanoia means I change my mind. 
And I like to say it like this. Repentance is when you break your agreement with the enemy and you make your agreement with God. And right then, I had to realize I made a mistake and I could be beat myself up and be in shame for what I did. Instead, I repented and I said, God, you may have sent us this way through my mistake to avoid an accident and to get us home, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. I choose to trust you. You coming down to repent? Oh, oh, oh okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to pray for you if you were there, bro. You know, maybe you were out driving and you got lost. Huh? Just, he, he, he never listens to your directions. We do need to pray. <laughs> no, where was I? Oh, and guess what? I kid you not. When we left Dover, the GPS said what time we should be home. And it kept on saying, going up one minute, down one minute, whatever. And I got off three times, missed it too, and got home at the same exact time that it said we were going to get home when I left Dover. Now, how, how did that work? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, there's places in your life, huh? No, I wasn't speeding. <laughs> What, what, no, yeah, yeah, for being the accuser of their brother. Yeah. yeah, now I'm lost again. But uh, let me tell you that there's things in your life, and I've met people, I've, I've worked with, with addicts and sexual addicted people, and we work with people that are wounded and broken and... and, and don't know who God is. And, and our process is discovering those things that are lies, that where their belief system is conformed to this world instead of with the kingdom of God and with the word of God. And so, and, and, and many times we run into people and what happens is they start taking these lies out, okay, right? And they said, you know, but I go to the altar and I repented and I repented and I repented. And nothing happens because the tower is still standing. There may be shame in your life. But I tell you, what can happen? What will happen? If there's a place of stronghold in your life, and I say whether you're walking in unholy shame. Now, I always say unholy shame because there's holy shame. It's good for you to feel godly sorrow. Unholy shame. Places that you feel like you've sinned so much and you carry that sin with you, and you always have this shame. You see, maybe there's a tower in your life in a different way. Maybe it's what you, you were saying today, Pastor Leroy, during the worship about fear. You were coming against fear. There's places God wants to break you of fear. Ruthie had a phobia. Of thunderstorms because she was climbing Mount Washington with her family and one of the friends of her family got struck by lightning but when she broke her agreement with that fear and it was under the anointing of God decades ago it got to the place where she l literally loves thunderstorms is not that not right she will actually go out in a metal suit in the middle of a thunderstorm. <laughs> Stretching the truth is telling a lie. <laughs> but you know what happens is you say, oh, I've tried and I've tried and I'm, I still suffer with this rejection and everything. But eventually what happens is, and I'm not going to do it right here, but you'll pull out that strategic lie and the whole tower will fall down. And you'll never go back to it because it will have changed your whole belief system. The, the thing is, is your pattern for how you're going to believe, is it aligned with who God says we are and who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us? 
or is it aligned with the world? Now, there's three reasons why people don't receive the truth about who they are. Now, I have a, a little box here. And what, what I did, did a couple times, uh, this was just recently, I taught this. I actually taught it to a group of Old Order Amish down at Twinbrook uh, just a couple months ago. They were Old Order Amish who are pursuing God. And someone asked me, said, man, they, they just need discipleship. Will you come in and talk to them? And he set up this meeting and about, there were about 45 of us, 40 or 45 of us that were in that uh, room. And at the end, and you know, Amish aren't used to coming forward, you know, like altar calls or anything like that. But I taught on gender and I taught about all the lies that the enemy talks to, tells us. And, and then I had all these Jenga blocks here. I would have them here today, but my saw didn't work. So that, I'll talk about that later, you know. I was mad about that too. No, and anyways, okay, uh, uh, okay, here's, here's one of the lies. And I had them come up and write their lie down, and then I had a, a trash bag, and after they wrote the lie down, they threw it in the trash bag. And what they were saying is, I will no longer agree with the accuser of their brethren. I will receive who I am in Christ, that I am a child of God. Son, of, son or daughter of God, that greater is he that is in me, that he that is in the world, that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in us, that I'm complete in him, that I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and on and on and on, that in the, I have a spiritual mind. I have the mind of Christ. I have put off the old nature. I will align everything in my life with every decision with the promises of God through faith. Because you remember in Hebrews, it says that they could not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. And let me just read you some of these Jenga things. I will never be good enough. Now, I, I, I picked that out because the most, the most confessed lie is the lie, I will, I am not good enough. I am not enough. Because that's what the accuser of brethren does. That's all accusation does. Accusation will always tell you you're not good enough. Now, there's two sides to this. I mean, if you work with inner city kids, and, and some of you do, and they're in your church, or people that come out of prison, you know, that have, they have, criminal records and whatever, all of them feel like they're not good enough. And so it keeps them from moving forward. Not good enough keeps people from moving into their giftings. Not good enough. If you're working with inner city kids, it's, they're not good enough, so they, didn't even try, they don't even try to go to college. <clears throat> if they have a writing talent, they will always say, no matter what, it happens. I'm not good enough to do this. You see? Now, there's another side to this. You're not good enough. It depends who you're comparing it to. There's a thousand areas in my life that I'm not good enough. And I'm fine not being good enough. There's a grace there to not be good enough. It depends who I'm comparing to. I can look at, I can, I, can, I can listen to Leroy and say, man, this guy has the best speaking voice in, in the universe. You know, I can look at myself, man, my voice isn't like, like Leroy's. You know, I can't sing like he sings. And some of you will compare yourselves among yourselves. But there, there are places you're not good enough. But that's the way God made you. You know why? Because in that place of where you feel deficient, you're able to be who you're called to be. And some of those insecurities in life that you're trying and trying to get rid of, I've told people, I said, God's not going to get rid of that insecurity. And they said, what do you mean? 
And I said, God's not going to get rid of that insecurity because it keeps you dependent upon him. It keeps you seeking him so that at all times, we are not affirming ourselves with the world's affirmation. All we're doing with the renewing of our mind is cleansing ourselves from the junk that we carry around. Now, I said, what are the three reasons? And I started reading these here. I don't deserve love. Another good enough. I am only what I do. These are, these are lies that they're breaking. These are great lies to get rid of. I have a lack of value in my life because I'm divorced. I'm not loved and valued. Nobody values me. Here's a lie. I renounce being a burden to others. I feel like I'm always a burden to others. I'm not worth anybody doing anything good to me. Isn't that something? These are people who grew up in Christianity. My value is only based on what I do. Now, I, I have many of these blocks. I have so many of these lies. But through the years, we've seen people transformed time and time again. And we've seen so many Jenga block towers come down. Three reasons I'm getting there. Okay? Number one. Most often, the people that I'm dealing with in the counseling room, as a pastor, or in, in my conferences, whatever, will relate to this here. A huge part of Christianity is still teaching people how to reform the old man, the old self. Discipleship programs self-affirmation programs, whatever, it's all trying to make that old man, that old flesh, righteous. And you can carry all the shame, and you can carry all the rejection that you experienced growing up. You can carry all those fears that you, you can carry them, and you can read books, and you can go to counseling courses and whatever, and try to make all these things better. You can carry all this junk, but Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Do you know what that meant? That means as a punishment, what the Roman soldiers would do, they'd kill somebody, and then they'd tie that person around your neck, and you had to carry that body of death around to you until it killed you. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And you can carry all those things around, but it's honestly trying to fix yourself on the natural is like unscrambling scrambled eggs probably not four probably not four or five of you in here could do that you know you can't unscramble scrambled eggs so God had a fix you know what the fix is die you die to that old person you see, your rejection, your spirit of rejection, your spirit of shame, all your unholy fears do not reside in the new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You're a new creature. You are crucified. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. He lives in me as me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Christ, the Son of God. He's in me. He accepts, uh, accepts us in our not enoughness to take us to a better place. <laughs> and so... I was teaching, talking to this guy, he had sexual addiction he had, for years and years and years. And, and I said, what do you see when you look in the mirror? And he was telling me all this junk that he saw, and there were some good things here. And then I said, 
where, who, who are you in Christ and who's God in you? And, and he couldn't hardly tell me anything about who God is in him and who he is in God. And I looked at him and I said, this is your old self. And you're making agreements with something that was crucified with Christ. The old man is a metaphor of the natural mind before the conversion. Do you understand that? And I said, this is where your sexual addiction lies. He said, but I get these thoughts all the time. I said, when you get the thoughts, just say, no, that's not me anymore, accuser of the brethren. You get, you get thoughts about something you did, the heinous sin that you did, the sexual abuse, the times you lied or cheated or stole or whatever, and you get these thoughts, you're converted into the new creature in Christ Jesus and say, oh, wait a minute, that's not me anymore. That's not me. And so, you know, in my inner healing ministry, I don't know, have any better words to say. It's discipleship ministry. I used to approach things years ago and it was more trying to help people get set free from the, these lies so they could serve God more fully and I'm not saying that's all wrong what but what I found out is that it's in the reverse is when you move forward and you obey God and you commit yourself to God and you repent and you align yourself with him all these things that you're trying to get deliverance from they'll go away now, there are some places you have to go back to the door point. Some people say, no, you never have to go back in the past. Yes, you do. But I think in contemporary Christianity, we have it in reverse. That's why there's so many books on who you are and whatever, because we think like if people get set free, then they'll be able to serve God more. And I say, no. No, we move forward. The Bible doesn't give the kind of emphasis the way we give on all this inner healing kind of stuff. And I'm saying as someone who has a whole course online on freedom from a wounded heart. And that leads us to the second one. Okay? It's why can't we receive who it is? It's because of false humility. Do you want false humility? It's the inability to receive what God says about us. I'm not good enough to be who God says I am. You know why? Because God, who, what God says about you is glorious. <laughs> that doesn't mean... Why would, why would God say anything less to his children? He made you glorious. And he doesn't want you to be like anybody else, but he wants you to be all that he has called you to be. And because you're good Anabaptists, you're very careful about affirming yourself. That's good. But where it gets off from humility to unholy humility is when you will not receive the fullness of who God says you are and you walk around and that leads us to the third place. You've heard this. The third place is you believe. Ouch! You believe the world. You believe the world. What does that mean? The world has a social. This is a social status ladder. You can get one of these. Just get Amazon social status ladder. You get one of these. Okay, this is social status ladder. And you have at the top of here, and I'm reminding, some of you may have heard this from me before, but on the top you have the people who are successful, that are beautiful, that are rich. You know, all these successful people, all the people that seem to have their act together and whatever. And you look at them and they're, 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 they're the kind of people, you know, in, in school, it's the cool kids, you know. You know, the, the popular people, you know. And, you, you know, they walk with a cool walk, you know. And you walk like this. And then you have the people down here, uh, you know, these are criminals and these are ugly people. 
No, I didn't. I was just thought you were looking at me and said, well, you're one. <laughs> and, and, and you have this hand. And then, and, and I give this out, at Take Back Your Life, at, if you came to the Youth Take Back Your Life of, uh, at uh, LBC years ago. And then I had people come up and point, where, where are you on the social status ladder? And the shocking thing that here were Christians that came and they put themselves from the middle to the bottom of the social status ladder. That's what they believed. That's, that was their identity. That's how they walked. And then the question I ask is, where should we be on this ladder? Some of you may know. Where should we be? What's that? Oh, you, amazing. Rarely does someone answer that the first time. Did you hear this before? Oh, you did. <laughs> you did, huh? Put your head in there, buddy. <laughs> You know what? And well, there's no carpet here, but usually I just toss it. You know why? Because we do not. Get... Point made. We do not go by the social status of the world. We don't compare ourselves to the world, and we don't walk in a worldly identity. We walk in a God identity. And so I will tell you, when I got this revelation, I was married and had two kids. I walked with a spirit of rejection. And when I got this revelation that, that there was nobody in this world that was better than me. Nobody. Nobody more valuable. There's no partiality with God. It changed my life. It freed me not to be self-focused. And along with that came the realization that there was nobody worse than me, under me. That in everybody, there's an image of God in everybody. And when you can see the image of God in your life and make agreement with it, your life is going to change. Ruthie. Don't make as many mistakes as I did. <laughs> oh, that wasn't even on. Do you mean they didn't even get that joke? Uh, the um, Bruce wanted me to share a couple incidences that through our marriage um, and growing up or whatever that God set me free of lies that I thought were just me. Uh, one of the first ones would be when I was really, really young, I know my dad used to hold me on his lap. And so one time I went to crawl up on his lap. I was probably three, three and a half. And when I did, he put his elbow out and said, no, you're too big. And that motion of my dad, and he meant it. He never again held me, uh, never again put his arms around me and hugged me, never once said, I'm so glad I had a daughter. Um, that was just his lack. You know, a wounded person will wound others. And I found we'll out when I... I found out when I got older that my dad um, was a very wounded man. He never got healed of that, so of course he wounded his children. And I'm not making excuse, I'm just saying he never opened the door for the Lord to come in and redeem that. And so uh, we children, you know, that was put on us. Anyway, in my dad rejecting me and not showing me any affection or love um, the whole time I was home, um, I took on the lie that said, I am not lovable. No one would want to love me, but it's okay. And you even struggle with God loving you. Yes. And my answer came out to, I'm okay. It, it's okay not to be loved. I'll, I'll get through life. It's okay. So to the point that that lie right there, it's okay, came to the place where no matter what was done around me, uh, what was done to me, um, I was never sexually abused or anything. I just mean like friends, if they'd say something that I didn't like or an adult or from the front of a church, 
you know, the, what the preacher said, and I didn't understand. It's okay. It's okay if I don't understand. It's okay if I get hurt. It's okay if you give your opinion in a conversation, but I can't give mine. That's okay. That's the lie. Another one was um, when uh, in growing up, again, in my father's woundedness, and it wasn't just me. There were seven children. He did it to all of us. Um, but something my dad did, and I didn't realize again till I was married how off this was, but when we uh, were coming home from church, and we'd all get excited that we're going to Grandma's house in the afternoon after we ate, <coughs> excuse me, um, my dad would say, nope, we're not going. So if we were coming home from uh, church in the car, and we'd say, oh, I can't go anywhere this afternoon, I have so much homework, my dad would say, we are going and you have to go. That was a constant pattern in my dad's dealing with us is if he heard we wanted to do something, he wouldn't let us do it. And if he found out we didn't want to do something, he made us do it. So what lie came into my life from that was, shh, don't ever tell what you want. Because if you do, the opposite will be done or you won't be able to do it. And the third one, I'm trying to think what the... Oh, well, let's talk about that. Okay. How did that affect me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's yes. a major point there, you know? <laughs> that was one of the reasons I didn't understand it until I got married because when you're um, single, you can pretty much uh, hide almost anything because you're not living with someone close who sees everything you do or don't do. So when we got married, um, this was, this was uh, something that built up because when you're first married, you do anything to make your sweetheart happy, right? Anything. And that was wrong for me too because I did not have a voice in our marriage. Um, I became a yes person. I became that woman who is so uh, submissive. That didn't come from me. No, no, that didn't come from Bruce at all. That came from my inner voice that said, <laughs> that said it's okay. Um, you know, if Bruce gets his way, if Bruce wants to do this, if Bruce wants to go here or there, I, sure, I'll go. doesn't matter. I'll go. I'll eat what he wants to eat. I'll um, have friends who he wants to have as friends. Uh, if he wants to buy a car and I didn't like it, doesn't matter. It's okay, Bruce. Now, I didn't always say that out loud. Oh, also, if we, want, if we were going to go out to eat, he'd say, where do you want to go? And I'd say, oh, anywhere. Anywhere is fine. So we go to McDonald's, and that was not fine. <laughs> if you're going out on a date, you do not want to go to McDonald's. Now, this was years and years ago. And he didn't care. It saved us money. He loved the hamburgers. And so why not? Put the massager. Yes. Then as we got, you know, longer into marriage, I loved when we're sitting together, I loved to put my feet up over his lap, and he would massage my feet. And I loved it. But I never told him. Why? Because I believed it was okay. No, no, I'm sorry. I believed that if I told him I liked it, he would stop. That, I didn't realize how motored my th uh, thought process was. But if, that which you feared came upon you oh, anyways because, when, because she didn't tell me, I stopped. Yep. And this was so many things. Go ahead. If we were in a group, uh, like a bunch of couples, and we were all talking, and then they called us to prayer like we were going to eat. And so let's all pray. Usually all the wives would go over with their husbands. And I would stay right where I was because I was afraid that if I walked over to Bruce, he would push me away like my dad did. And I didn't want to be any more rejected, so I just stayed there. So who do you think hurt by that? Bruce. And he would say to us when we are first married, he'd say, Ruthie, do you love me as much as I love you? Because if I expressed myself and expressed what I wanted, he would stop it. So if I, we were in the group with everyone going over to their spouses, if I walked over and stood here and he pushed me away, I could not stand that rejection. So it was a fear of rejection. So how did you get victory? Well, and also it was people pleasing. And so how I got victory is one Saturday morning, we were, this is one you want me to tell, right? 
uh, one Saturday morning, uh, we were, this is when our children were born and, and grown up some, and every Saturday morning we'd just kind of do a clean through of the house. And um, in the morning, uh, before lunch, we were doing these different chores, and I noticed Bruce didn't come by, he didn't give me a squeeze on the shoulder, he didn't ruffle my hair, he didn't give me a hug, uh, he didn't come in and say anything nice to me, he just stayed busy over here, and the kids and I stayed busy over here. And at lunchtime, after the kids had eaten um, and were outside playing, I said to Bruce, I said, are you okay? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, this morning, you didn't touch me one time. You didn't say hi, you didn't anything. He said, you noticed? Because so much of what Bruce did for me, he was very affectionate, he was very kind, he was very considerate of my feelings and I didn't know how to express myself to him and he needed it so badly. And I, and I would say that, that, that 19 out of 20 endearments came from me to her. That's why he wondered if I loved him not, as much as he loved that, me. So I said, wait a minute, I'm just doing this for myself. I said, she doesn't need it. So I pulled back and then... This happened. So that afternoon we went outside it was a beautiful summer day we went outside and sat on the swing and probably for four or five hours we discussed this because i was able to for the first time see that the rejection of my father had so become a part of me and i thought it was me and so i could not express myself to bruce the way he needed and he was hurting he loved me, he didn't pull away from me, but he was hurting. He was a man who needed me to come up and hug him. He was a man who, like, there'd be couples out at a picnic, and the guys would be sitting down, and, the, you know, the wives would be sitting around, and I had to do something with the kids. And when I came back, I might have been gone a half an hour, and when I'd come back, I'd just stay. He might be sitting there, and I'd just kind of stay here and get involved in the conversation, but not go over to him. Why do you think that was? Mm -hmm. He was going to push me away in my little girl mind that had grown up with me and become part of me. So what we did is we, Ruthie, in, in realizing where it came from, she pulled out the Jenga block that made the whole tower come down. And I, I tell you, that was a stronghold in her life and from that time, that was decades ago, from that time, Ruthie isn't a good affirmer. She didn't just overcome the problem. She became more than a conqueror. I mean, I just have a wife that is lavish, and we have never gone back to that because why? The stronghold of the enemy was broken. Her mind was renewed, and it enabled... Christ to be formed in her. And I had no idea that I was like that. I had no idea I was bound up. I had no idea I was walking in rejection. I had no idea. I'm saying that because so often when we need set free, we need others to come and talk to us. Or when the Lord goes after it, we right away say, no, I'm fine. Because the enemy wants us to keep things that he wants to set free, or the Lord wants to set free. The enemy loves to keep it hidden. He loves to keep us in the dark. But when he shines this light on something, I just want to say, ask the Lord, God, what are you going after? And when you open the door for the Lord to go after something, he will come in and he will sit with you and he will talk with you and he will open a door of freedom. And in terms of these Jenga blocks, you weren't enough for me to receive my love. But you broke that, and now, even in your not enoughness, you're okay. And it's just, there's, there, it's just not there. The tension isn't there or whatever. And that wasn't, that wasn't a, a huge part of a relationship. It was just one tower, one more, and you have to tell this in 37 seconds or less. Okay, it's the lie that freed you up when you realized you're about to make a quiet spirit. Oh, yes. Um, 37 seconds. <laughs> I thought there was real value as a believer, as a woman, as a little girl growing up, basically to be seen and not heard, that that was valuable to be quiet. 
and I wasn't a real quiet person. I, at, in, I was in sports in high school. She uses her 25,000 words that women speak. She uses them every day. <laughs> and that's how I was with my friends in sports, on the buses, going to the sports, and even coming home. I was the loudest cheerer. I love to get people going. I love to tell jokes. I loved it when people laughed. I wasn't obnoxious. I was just a very talkative person. So, but I was taught it was more valuable to stay calm. And I was reading a verse one day and it said, um, uh, a meek and quiet spirit is of great reward in the eyes of the Lord. I know I'm not saying it exactly right. And I was reading that and reading that and it kept hitting me a meek and quiet spirit. It did not say a meek and quiet personality. God gave me, again, I wasn't obnoxious. I just had a lot of joy, and I loved using it. I loved being it. Yeah. And I draw, drew people to, to the crowd by pointing people out and having fun. But... I also had to break the lie that who God made me wasn't proper enough. I should be more quiet. I should be more um, mild. Uh, if we're in a group, don't say anything. You don't have anything to say anyway. That's the lie that was in me. And so when God said that, that it's my spirit that is to be meek and quiet, that means I'm meek and quiet before my Father, meaning listen be quiet sometimes and listen to the father and stay meek before him so that he can teach me and guide me and live through me and so i broke the lie that it was a woman's personality that had to be meek and quiet but it was her it is our spirit and i say women if you love to worship, worship. If you love to sure. laugh and have fun and be creative and all those things, if you love to just swing your children and, and have fun. I think, you know, when I was a little girl, I used to love to swing around and dance when in church, you know, when I was really little. And I wondered, when did that stop? That this little girl in me had gotten shut down and I became this straight, straight person who didn't do anything wrong. And I just want to say to you women, any of you, that if you've been in your mind, felt that you could not be the woman that God created you to be, I just want you to open up and say, God, you have made my heart after you. You have made my desire to listen to you and have quiet time with you. But my personality is not what I'm supposed to be or shut down to be. I am to be who God created me to be. So I, I just want to say, if that's going on in you, any of you women, um, if, if there's something just in you that you want to let out because of who God made you, I would say in the Lord, go, go to him and see if it's your spirit that you've been walking in or has it been a personality that's been put on you and ask the Lord to set you free. Mm -hmm. I want you to stay up here. Um, I just pray. Okay, we're going to close here just with uh, uh, one more thing. And uh, Ron, I want you to play that in a minute. But I want you to just pray over them. I feel like there's like, like one of the big things is uh, the, the poison of people pleasing. Mm -hmm. And it's a poison. I don't care what people think about me unless what they think is right. I always had that little thing on the end. And if you run everything through the filter of what someone's going to think, you will never be obedient to God. It is a filter that needs to die put on the cross. And, and I think women struggle with it a little bit more than men, but men do too. I want you to pray for that, and then I'm going to pray. We're going to listen to the testimony, and then I have a little altar call. Okay. okay. Father, I thank you that you have opened so many doors for us as people where the enemy wants to keep us bound, where we ourselves keep ourselves bound, where the enemy wants to keep us in darkness, you so offer us in every area, you offer us your light. And as we open the door and walk towards you, you said you will come in and sit with us. And so, Father, if there's rejection, if there's fear, 
if there's an okay spirit that says, well, it doesn't matter, um, I'll just flow with what's going on, God, any of those um, things, shame, Lord, I just ask you right now to open people's hearts, open men and women's hearts to say, God, is there a place, are there places in my life where I'm listening to the voice of the enemy and I think, think, think all the time that that's just me. Father, I pray that you'll break that wide open, that what the enemy meant for evil, you, God, have made us brand new. You take what's impossible in our uh, soul, and you go to our spirit, and you make it possible as we open the door to you. So, Father, thank you for that. Thank you that every person in here has every opportunity to walk in who you have made them to be, and also to open the door so your spirit can work through them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want you to stay up here. Uh, We're going to play that, um, uh, just one more video, but what we're going to do now, I have, I I didn't bring Jenga blocks, so I brought three by five cards, so just pretend they're Jenga blocks, okay? My soul won't work. And what I want you to do, because I believe this could be transforming in ways that, uh, that things can come down in your life. If you just say, I, I can't do this because I'm telling you, almost anything God wants you to do, it's beyond your, you're not enough to do it. That's why you need faith. Christ wants to do it in you and through you, but if you're always judging yourself by yourself, you'll never get there. And so what I want you to do, I want you to come up, I'm going to have pens and pieces of paper up here. And what... What's that? Yeah, uh, they're in there. Uh, they're in the box here. And if you want to just um, put that over so they don't write on those. <laughs> um, and what I want you to do, I want you to come up and I want you to write your lie. The lie of the enemy. Where you've agreed with the world, the flesh, the devil, where the, you've agreed with the accuser, the brethren, and what you're doing, you just write that lie and then... I would like someone to hold. Is there a young person that would like to hold the trash bag? That's all you got to do. Stand over and hold the trash bag. Who would like to? All right, you come up here. You, are, you look like a trash bag holder. I mean it. I couldn't imagine anybody that had the profile. All you got to do is you just got to hold this. And then you write this, whatever lie. You say, no more people, please. It, it can be general. No more people, please. No more holding myself back. No more arcaneness thousand different things. I want you to write your lie down, and then I want you to put it in a trash bag to be gone forever, okay? By a once-for-all act, we put off the old man in this area. By a once-for-all act, we put on the new man, and our mind is being transformed. And then um, after, after we play this, um, then if you can put on some music, and then you can come up and write these things down on the stage, if you just move them out a little bit more so that there's more space there, okay? Uh, And play this loud enough that it gets on the tape. This has just happened the first time I ever taught this. A lady came up at the end. Because I lived what Brother Bruce has been sharing. When I was a child, my father was an alcoholic, and he didn't have a lot of patience with his children but he never had a father to teach him how to be a father. But when I was a child, if he would get angry, and this one time he got very angry at me about something, and he said to me, you're never satisfied. With such hatred in his eyes. I lived with that. That thing caused me so much pain, helped me to make so many wrong decisions and choices in my life. It was only one month ago that the Lord brought that to my attention. That is not yours. You're living the lie. I was allowing that statement, you are never satisfied, to cause me to be one who strives constantly to be a perfectionist, to do everything just right. And if I didn't, I couldn't stand myself. I was very unpleasant with uh, my family. They had to put up with my perfection. (laughs) Oh, Lord. But God has forgiven me. And he showed me that I was living that and that all I had to do was renounce it and say, that's not mine. 
that's not mine. I couldn't find anything in my father's word that said I had to carry that. So I said, it's not mine. I'm not living there anymore. And praise God, I don't live there anymore. And I thank God for bringing this brother so that I got a chance to. Stand up. You can put some music on there. Uh, do you have a uh, prayer team? What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to come up and ask you, and all you got to do is write the lie on the cards. Grab a card. There's pencils and pens up here. Bring your own, whatever. And, and I want you to make decisions. If God told you, I want to tell you, if God told you, uh, I was with a lady just on uh, Ruthie and I at a conference, and we got to talk to her, and she always believed that God had told her that she was going to influence many, many people, but she could never see it. And there was a time in her life that she had to break agreement and said, God told me this. And she had to break her natural mind and saying, I'm not enough to do this. And she broke it. And now she's powerful, influencing many people on, the, on track to be an influencer. There may be things that you're just put on the shelf that you can't believe God said to you because you're not good enough. And guess what? And maybe some of the places where you're struggling in your life and you feel like you're not good enough, it's just because you're not and it's okay. Just so that you're in faith and peace, whatever. And if you fill out something and you want someone to declare over you, then if there's a prayer team or whatever, I don't know what you do here. But anyways, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. We break the enemy's chains. We break him in the name of Jesus that the legal right of the enemy is going to be broken and, the, and I'm telling you, the power of the enemy in your life is going to be broken as you submit yourself unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And we'll just stand up here. And if there's anybody who wants to come up here, fill a card and get free, come on up. Just grab a card and a pencil and fill them out. What's that? No, no. It just, if anybody wants, after you do this, go over to the prayer team if you want prayer. Okay? And if you want, where's Ruthie? Where's Ruthie? Did she disappear? Oh, I thought you went home. Uh, okay. If anyone wants Ruthie to pray with her, with them about, any women wants Ruthie to pray for her about some of the things she talked about, ask Ruthie to pray for you after you fill out your card if you want. Okay? Or before.
declare in the name of Jesus, we just declare the release, the forgiveness, the removing from east, as far as east is from west, buried in the depths of the sea, and everybody who renounced a lie never to agree with anything that comes from the enemy, the world, or the flesh again. And we just declare this in the heavenlies in Jesus' name. Amen. Leroy. For, for sharing the way that you have and for ministering the way that you have. Um, there's times that you go through a season like this. I just recently went through something where the Lord revealed something to me about my own personal life. An agreement that I had made with the enemy <clears throat> um, related very much to something that happened when I was in high school. Uh, some things that were done and spoken that I had come into agreement with and had no clue that it was affecting my life. <clears throat> and so these, these times are extremely important for us to take ownership and authority over the things, the open doors that we have, we have put in place that will affect us from walking in freedom. Also, also this morning... Not only do I want to make sure that you find the time and, and find a connection with someone to, to pray for you if that's what you need, but also if you need someone to pray for you and just speak a prophetic word into you or speak life into you, I want you to make sure that you take the time and position yourself to do that and to receive that as well. Amen. Church, thank you. Yeah, it, um, I don't know how to explain this to you, but when I see a church respond to the word of the Lord, it blesses my heart the same as it would bless my heart if I see my children making the right decisions. There's no greater joy than to see for a father to see his, his sons and daughters, his children follow the Lord and to serve the Lord and, and surrender and, uh, and just prosper position themselves and position their hearts to receive from heaven. And so to see you as a church respond this way, I just want to tell you again, and you do, you respond so well, but I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for being obedient. Amen. Pastor Burl will transition over to you with uh, for announcements, and then we'll have one song. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh... Thank you again, Bruce. Really appreciate you bringing the word this morning. Uh, for a few announcements, and uh, yes, you may be seated just for a few minutes here as we uh, go through this. Um, as you may have noticed, we had a time for communion uh, this morning during worship, and that is uh, something we're going to do the first Sunday of uh, each month. So uh, you can look forward to that. It's just a time for you, your family, however, to go back at any time. And so you will see that again in January. All right, uh, Naomi, you said you have an announcement. Good morning. Um, this is an announcement for Friday night. We have Ladies Night, and it will be held at Rhonda's place um, at 6:30, I believe. We're planning. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We're planning on having a chocolate dipping party with cookies and all kinds of goodies. So. Please be generous with what you bring. Um, bring extra things that you want to, anything, we're going to white chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, all the good stuff. Um, come in your comfy clothes, and um, we will provide the chocolate. You bring the things to dip in the chocolate, and then be prepared to share what you're bringing. You're not going to take home everything that you brought, okay? So um, come prepared to share. Uh, all of you, what you brought with everybody and we'll and also bring containers to take items home in because then we will 
you'll get to take a little bit of everything home. So um, come for a good time. Rhonda will be making supper and uh, a light supper for us. So we're looking forward to that. We bless her and her gifting in the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to a good time. Also, parking will be along the road and we will send out a message later this week for you to RSVP because we'd like to know how many people for her for the food. So um, we'll send out a message later this week with her number to respond in a text form. Thank you. All right. And another announcement is uh, there is a men's night out schedule for 2021. And so as you go out, there's going to be some papers uh, laying out there where you can uh, please grab one, see if your name's on the list, because it is possible then that your name is on the list uh, to host one of those uh, men's night out events. Okay, so, and then lastly, uh, there's going to be another paper out on the, um, on the table or, or out there at the um, doorway, and that is going to be uh, just a, a, a fundraiser, uh, kind of a side business for Leroy and Naomi, and I'm sure they could explain it a whole lot better. And so, but, but the, um, what it's all tied to, uh, partly, is, is the fact that there has been some, some um, well, last year, they, Leroy was involved with a motorcycle accident. I think most of you are probably aware of that. And just because of the uh, circumstances involved there, um, their, the insurance was, did not cover it. And, um, and so they, because of that and, and some other things, they, they felt like they would like to um, have this available. So what, what they have here is coffee and, and also candles that are available that you can purchase. And uh, so these, uh, this paper here, it's double-sided. It explains both of that, uh, both of those things that you can purchase. And I'm not going to go into maybe a whole lot more detail, but it is Wallhouse Coffee. And if you're familiar with Wayne Weaver from Ohio, it's a coffee that uh, his company um, makes and made available to Ohio. And so they are bringing that coffee, making it available here in Pennsylvania. They are the only... Uh, supplier, so they are looking forward to that opportunity. And um, and as far as the uh, the candles, that is the Stony Ridge candles, um, Stanford sister. All right, so that's the connection there. From Ohio is is the person who uh, makes those candles. Is that correct? Indiana. Sorry, Indiana. Okay, okay. So um, all the yeah, some of those details will be on uh, this paper that you can grab on the way out. Feel free to talk to uh, Naomi um, or Leroy about this. And then also, if you, if you would like to uh, donate just uh, towards Leroy and Naomi's expenses, um, you can do that directly, and you can feel free to talk to me uh, about how to do that. Um, and uh, you can uh, just bless them um, through the church. So just want to make you aware of that, that you have this paper available to pick up and also uh, the one for Men's Night Out. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, so this coming Saturday is the youth uh, volleyball tournament. It's a fundraiser just for their general youth activities and possibly a trip that they might be going on next year. Um, so we do still have food items that need to be donated. So if you guys want to donate any food, um, come and talk to me. It's not like cooked food. It's just raw food, rolls, hot dogs, that kind of stuff. Um, so come and talk to me after church, or if you do, um, the, my phone number was sent out on like a group message that Leroy had sent out earlier this week. My phone number is there. Just let me know by tomorrow, because um, after that we're going to be buying the food. Um, so again, the tournament is a Saturday. You guys are more than welcome to come out and support the youth. It's going to be at uh, Lidditz Area Mennonite. It's going to be starting, I think, around 7.30, um, and then be going for most of the day. So... Yeah, if you have any, would like to donate food, come see me. All right, sounds good. Any other announcements? All right. Hi, so for you guys that don't know, my name is Fanny. Um, this last week has been insane, and I've been, like, wrestling with God just because he put something on my heart, and that was missions. And on it's been happening ever since Tuesday. And... Friday, I had the opportunity to sign up for YWAM in Mexico. My sister's there right now. 
Um, so I put in my application three hours later, I got accepted. So I'm going to YWAM <laughs> um, in three and a half weeks and I don't have money to go. So I, right now I'm like, it's really hard for me to trust God that he's gonna provide the finances. I know he will, but it's like, I don't know, it's just crazy because I'm leaving in three and a half weeks. So if you guys wanna support me financially, and also just um, keep me in your prayers um, as I go and as I do mission work for the Lord. That would be amazing. Thank you. All right. Very good. So definitely keep her in mind. Daniel, you have So I don't know if you guys know about Nicole Hutzi's show. It's happening uh, today. It was today and yesterday. Uh, there's a showing via live stream uh, 2 and 7 today. Really good show. Um, I'm on the production team, so that's how I know all about it. Um, but yeah, you can get a live stream link at b2bd.org. That's B, uh, the letter B, the number two, letter B, and D.org. So yeah, check it out. It's a really good show. Born to be Different Productions is what it stands for. Um, you could probably find it on, I know you can find it on Facebook as well. Um, but yeah going to be live streamed at 2 and 7 today so All right. sounds good okay Lira turn it over to you all right <clears throat> Bruce thank you again Ruthie thank you again um, so much for sharing it, it resonates so much in my heart um, I think this whole thing that my wife and I've been walking through for the last I don't know, a year and a half almost. Well, in, in June, it'll be two years, so we're, we're a year and a half into this thing. I think this whole motorcycle accident and uh, insurance, the mess that we've had with that, and, and then involving a lawyer and just everything that we've been through, it has really exposed some lies that I've been believing from the enemy. And, and the lies were so real that I took them on as identity. And... Uh, here just recently in the last month, God has really brought one to the forefront that I really took authority over. And Ruthie, what you shared in your testimony, I could literally tell from one day to the next, there was literally I, everything, the way that I looked at things, the way that I saw things, the release that I felt was massive. Now, I think I'm still going to go through a renewing of my mind because I'm going to see how I've allowed that lie um, to infiltrate other areas of my life and how it has affected me. But this whole thing has really, really brought us to a place where we said, you know what, there's a greater plan that we're not seeing and, and there's lies standing in the way. And, and we took a tower down about a month ago. And uh, so it's difficult for, for me to have Verlin stand up here and announce that we're doing a fundraiser for for our medical expense kind of sucks but i told the team i said it's probably just my pride but our desire is that from this day forward that we put things in place that nothing like this ever happens again that we start making some good decisions and uh and so the other thing is too is that we felt like by doing this we want to take ownership we want to do what we can um to take care of it and we're not we're not asking everybody else to cover it so but I think it's even beyond this because when that lie was broken off I saw something that I believe that Lord is going to open some doors for us especially related to coffee so maybe in the coming days you'll you'll see things on Facebook or you'll hear us talk about it but I love Wallhouse coffee there's no two ways about it amen but you know what, in response to the message, in response to the lies, in response to the word of the Lord that you have received, let's stand and let's sing the song at the cross. Because when we come to the foot of the cross and we receive the blood of Jesus that has paid the price, paid the penalty, paid the ransom for the things that have bound us, we will experience a freedom unlike anything before verse 2 listen to this Bruce and Ruthie listen to verse 2 there's a place where sin and shame are powerless and then incredible that unholy shame 
There's a place where sin and shame are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. Isn't that beautiful? That's a great picture. be right with you. <laughs> oh, my battery's dead. We should probably do the batteries before. That might be the thing to do. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Rowe. Okay, yes, uh, Roy just has something to share real quick. Yeah, um, I was kind of wrestling if I wanted to share this or not, but I think the song just confirms it, um, especially about the shame, um, the shame and the blood of Jesus takes care of that unholy shame. Um, I'm not going to share in a lot of detail, just real quick, but um, just a little bit and you can feel free to um, talk to me afterwards and I just add for people that um, would want to know that you know the proper authorities have investigated this but when I was when I was too young to remember um, I was forced to do some things that a young child should never do and um, in turn when I when I became started to become a man I forced uh, other people to do things that they should never be forced to do earlier this year the blood of Jesus became real to me and the shame the song the blood of Jesus the shame it came and it, it washed it and I could feel a cleanness in my soul because God said, when I look at you, I don't see that. There may be people here today, and I didn't even know that I had that shame. But when, when he came and when his blood washed through my soul, I just sat there and wept because his blood is enough his blood he died for your unholy shame you don't have to be ashamed and that that blood that testimony is why I can stand here and I can say these things because shame has lost its grip on me thank you for for sharing um, this man has shared in detail what happened uh, went through went through the whole reporting thing went through that whole process was not charged with anything but I will tell you this the man is up here shaken why is he up here shaking so bad when he is testifying of the things of God because I believe it's in Revelation. Is it Revelation chapter 4? They overcame him. I think it's Revelation chapter 4, verse 12. Or 12, 4. Did I have that mixed? Re Revelation 12, 4. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, which we're going to sing about, and by the word of their testimony. So Roy, in Jesus' name, be released. Be released.
dismiss you. Fanny, I want to bless you. In Jesus' name, what you just did by sharing up front here, that what, what, what you've been sensing came to you very quickly, 
and you very quickly came into agreement with what God was saying. This is exactly what I've been talking about, that our seasons are going to change very quick, and we have to be ready in season and out of season to say yes to the word of the Lord. You don't have a clue how God is going to provide for you financially, but you came into agreement with what God has said. You need to raise thousands of dollars, and I want to declare over you in Jesus' name that his kingdom will be released because of your faithfulness and because of you walking in obedience to the word of the Lord. And you said yes to the call. And I pray in Jesus' name that the kingdom is opened over the top of you and he would pour out his abundant resources. Amen. Congregation, you're dismissed in Jesus' name.